metric of how popular a game is. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to ask a question so quick, but what are negative points? What are negative points? Well, we're going to talk about that a bit. I guess I mean, quite simply, it's anything that gives you a negative point, of course. But then there's also punishing mechanisms and negative points that are disguised in in slightly different ways. So, it's like a you know, a curse card in Dominion, it's a negative point, but it's also a card that sits in your deck and slows your deck down if you got like two punishments to it. And we'll go through some examples as we go. Right? Yeah. But yeah. so I was really surprised because you know to start this I was like okay let's find some common ground examples some popular games that have negative points or punishing mechanisms and of these games I'm pretty sure Carcassonne is the only one that doesn't have an explicit negative point or punishment system in the base game at least the expansions do add punishing mechanisms but every other one of these in Catan you've got the robber which is sort of player inflicted but you're discarding when you're over seven. Pandemic is just a giant punishing machine that wants to hurt you. Seven Wonders has negative points. Terraforming Mars, I believe, has negative points. Codenames has an insta lose. Ticket to Ride, I mean, I've seen negative scores in Ticket to Ride, so anyway. True. Um, and then Azul has the. Uh, yeah, so. Um, I was playing a game with my brother a few weeks ago, and he would have gotten 105 points if he had placed one route, but instead he got three points. He didn't place that route. And his score was just, he just got three points in the world, which is so funny. Anyway, um, so yeah, so what are negative points? So I think bad things happening to you doesn't necessarily mean it's a punishing mechanism. It's still bad and it's still unwanted, but if it's just a random event that has occurred to you in a game, or if it's another player attacking you, it's not necessarily a response to your actions, to things that you and that's why I think... So take that is separate from punishing, is what you're saying, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a player punishing you, but it's not a punishing mechanism of the game itself. It's not the game trying to tell you, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't have done this thing here. Right, so, right, okay. So this is, this is kind of separating out a player's ability to punish, quote-unquote, another player from the game itself. The systems that we as designers put in using punishment or negative points to direct their, their play or their behavior. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, okay, so here are the different types I broke down. And if anyone thinks of a type that doesn't fit here, or for that matter, if anyone has any comment or question whenever, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, so these are the different types, how at least we were able to break it down. And if anyone thinks of any more, uh, I'd be happy to hear about them. So number one, negative points, of course. Lose a turn, we're not going to explore this one too deeply because frankly, I feel like it's been established that it's not, it's not great. It's not, it's not a great system to have people play your game less. Um, cooperative <laughs> games, I think just about every cooperative game is somehow punishing. It's built in somehow a variety of ways, really. Um, push your luck, you're punished every time you push too far, like I do in every push your luck game I play. Um, auto lose and player elimination, which are different, but I think can have a similar feeling for players. Damage and combat, which again often is other player inflicted, sometimes it's the game inflicting upon you. Um, gambling and bluffing, you're punished by losing money, you're punished when your opponent can read you correctly, and then some other stuff that falls into more uh, weirder categories. Yeah? We might get to this in a little bit, but I'm curious, are all of these equal? Are all of them equal? What do you, equal under what? Under what um, metric? So if you're talking about different types of punishing mechanisms, I'm wondering if you weight these similarly for your case. Like this is a case for negative things. Is this a case for lose a turn more frequently in games? Or are there certain ones that you think are better mechanisms than others to have in your game? I don't know. That's a big question. That's kind of I guess that's kind of <laughs> well, I, and I would say, I mean, my personal opinion would be these are all completely weighted, but the weights are different based on what your goals are. Mm -hmm. Right? I'm sure it would take me a minute, but we could probably come up with a reason lose your turn is good, or a context, right? A specific mm -hmm. situation mm -hmm. where lose a turn is great. Yeah. I think it would I think it would be a project. I think it would take <laughs> some doing for us to figure that out. But so clearly that one is lower for most situations. Uh, negative points, does true negative numeric points don't make sense if you don't have a point system, right? So clearly there are <laughs> some contexts to these where it makes more sense or contexts where it makes less sense. But 
I would also say that if you're talking about an argument for these things, and we'll get into it a little bit more, but the, the excitement element, I've sat down with game designers, oh, my game is boring. Well, okay, maybe that's because there, there isn't uncertainty or because there isn't this risk. These are ways of introducing mechanical risk. The game is telling you this is going to be hard or risky or potentially very punishing based on how it goes for you. And there are certain kinds of games where that is, that is the, the place that you need to spend time, is thinking about how do I enhance risk? How do I enhance excitement? It's feedback, right? I mean, yeah. giving players points is one form of feedback, and then telling players don't do this is a, is like not just the opposite. It's it's weird. It's different. Avoid this thing. It's so different than pursue pursue this thing. Um, I had a point. Now I'm losing it. Well, must have been a negative one. It. What's that? <laughs> must have been a negative one. Yeah, it's probably a negative. One, so. <laughs> okay, so cooperative games at first. I think this is fascinating. It is, just because, I mean, like, what cooperative game is not punishing? I mean, one I thought of was, like, The Crew. Is it punishing when you lose a mission? Like, yeah, I guess so, but uh, not in the same way Pandemic punishes you with a bunch of cubes, and then, oh, what's that? You struggle to get rid of those cubes? Well, here's a bunch more. And, like, what's that? The city's a problem for you? Well, we're going to put it on the top of the deck so you try to get it a few turns. <laughs> That's, like, punishing you mid Mid experience. And I particularly think this highlights your definition of, because I'll admit it is his definition of the punishment is it's the mechanics driving something negative, not another player. Well, in a cooperative game, you have nothing but, right? Every, with, with certain exceptions, I'm sure, I think cooperative games are often defined by the negative things that are constantly happening to you unless you try to, to deal with them, right? Looking at Spirit Island is another great example. Every single round, literal white plastic people show up on your island and try to turn it into New York City. And if you don't <laughs> deal with that, they're going to do that and you're going to lose. And the whole game is defined by the net, not, yeah, the spirits are cool and there's all this stuff, but the game itself is about the bad thing that is constantly happening to this island and your ability to deal with it. And then just one, I feel like, is defined by its punishing mechanism. If it were only, so I'll explain it because I can probably say the rules in a sentence or two. Um, we're trying to get one person to guess a word. We're all a team. Everybody writes their clues on little whiteboards, and then they show them to each other, but not that person. If any of them are the same, they get knocked out of the round. We don't get to show those clues to the person. Mm -hmm. So if it were just everyone write a word and like, oh, haha, -ha, six people wrote Luke for the word Jedi, it would be a lot less interesting. But instead, it creates this weird minefield of like, how do I give something, how, do I, how can I be helpful here without writing the most obvious thing. It's, I think it's like the defining rule of that, of that game. Um, and I remember the thing, by the way, it was, if you're, if you're getting feedback from your game and you're struggling to find anything that people like, just add a bunch of things that people don't like. That's <laughs> <laughs> tension right there. That's right there, right there. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, cooperative <laughs> games, I feel like we could talk about the punishing mechanisms in them for a while. Like Forbidden Desert and Pandemic and Spirit Island, I think I haven't played it actually, but they both make the whole system more difficult to work with, right? It's like a, it's like a lose more almost. The worse you're doing, the worse you're about to but, be Or doing. at the very least, the default, uh, I think way too much maybe about the, the systems and the way the systems work, and really as a designer, we're making an, an automata, we're making a system that they're kind of a machine. Well, the default state of the system of a cooperative game is lose. You, <laughs> you are just, a cooperative game is at its best when the only thing you're doing as players is just pulling it up from the very brink <laughs> at all times. It's too easy if you're not doing that, right? And so, how do you do, if, if you're a designer who's thinking, gee, I really want to be the next Matt Leacock, I really want to design a cooperative game, for one, know that Pandemic was an accident, and for two, <laughs> really understand, I think it, it comes from understanding this balance of punishment and, and fun, right? Like the excitement and the risk and the reward, and what are some of these tools that you can use as a designer to add just the right amount of punishment and negativity. 
And then Space Cadets, which is a bit lesser known, I don't know if anyone here has played it, it's a wonderful co-op filled with mini games. Almost everything that happens in that game is a punishment in some form. Your, your, the stations of your spaceship are getting less efficient, there's enemies coming at you from all over, they're dealing damage to you, and then the best rule of the game is the only way you can lose is if a core breach happens and your ship blows up, which is a little matching game where you have 30 seconds to pass around a deck of cards and find matches. And that's it. If someone doesn't find their match, the game is over. That's it. It's just over. And it's so fun. And it's like a two hour long co op. So it's, <laughs> it's particularly hilarious when someone doesn't uh, make a match successfully. Great game. <laughs> okay, so this is another category where it's hard to think of a push your luck game that isn't punishing. It's just sort of in the name. You push your luck. Like, you know, what's the pushing game? What happens if you push too far? Well, uh, you lose Kratz and Kruppenberg every single time. Uh, by the way, someone in the world has to be the least lucky player in Quacks. It's like, it's got to be someone. It's me. <laughs> 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 um, but Deep Sea Adventure is a funny one, because not only can you push your luck in that game, but you're pushing everyone's luck together as a team, because sure. you've got a shared oxygen tank, because you all dive down to get treasures. Um, it's 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 a really funny, weird one. And then Can't Stop is just such a classic, pure, push-your-luck game. Um, yeah, and I think I think this one's interesting. You know, I, it took me a minute when, when Pete's going through these, these different examples, talking about push-your-luck. I think something that makes that thrive is when a push-your-luck game convinces you that whatever it is that you don't quite have is already yours and you really want it, right? Like, these ingredients that you're pulling out in quacks, you know exactly how good these are. You know you want to keep going, right? And and so it's just this, this loss aversion of, I don't want to lose this, versus the fear of missing out of, but I don't want to get less than Josh did, so I got to keep going. Mm -hmm. And so they're really, a lot of these sit between what are two, psychologically speaking, sort of two negative things, right? Fear of missing out versus loss aversion. Mm -hmm and how they balance that, and then somehow turn it into fun. Like, the two, two anxiety-inducing aspects of the human psyche turned into fun. Yeah, and I think a successful push-your-luck game is one where good play looks like pushing your luck a, a good portion of the time. If, you know, if, if that's not the right decision, if you just play until it's totally safe to back out and cash in your points, it becomes a little dull. Like, you can't stop the person who's won usually has what looks like incredible luck, but you know, often it's just uh, knowing, knowing when to push it and when to, when to stop, I guess. Um, all right, yeah, we can yeah. move right. on. Negative points. It's, I mean, why we're all here. So negative points, I think, are one of the simplest forms of punishment. They don't necessarily hurt you mid-game. In fact, I would say they usually don't, but just like you're racking up points, you're racking up negative points, and it's the game very simply saying, hey, don't do that. Don't fail to complete your route in Ticket to Ride. Don't take that gigantic card in No Thanks. Um, and Patchwork is a funny one because it's at the start of the game in Patchwork, it's minus two points per square. How many squares do you have? 81. You begin with minus 162 points. It's incredibly punishing right out of the gate. I think the first time I played, my wife and I were both uh, deep in the... And the rulebook makes, at least the version that we have, the rulebook rule book makes very explicit negative scores in the end are common. This is not, you're not playing it wrong, you're playing it probably well if you're that good at keeping each other from scoring. And so, I think Patchwork, and I, I love that you very tastefully left off Tiny Towns, but likewise, Tiny Towns is negative one point per square, right? And so if you start with negative 16 points right there. It was negative two. It was negative two? That was too much. Oh, well, so I think, I think it's interesting because you could, there may be the clearest examples yet because you could have left them blank you could the as designers you could have said well they're just this is nothing and it's you start at zero and you go up from there so what led you to introduce negative why the negative point then i mean right now we're kind of up to the the, the crescendo of what then led you to decide negative one was better than zero or negative two was better than zero because it's funny, it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> i mean i I enjoy getting negative scores in a game. I love when that's possible. Like the bottom is nearly limitless. You know, don't go there. <laughs> Aim for points, but definitely don't fall off the bottom. 
Um, there's just something. <laughs> there's something about that. I guess as a as a designer who comes at this more analytically, looking at these two, I think maybe then what you did by accident, even if you did it for fun, and what I think is so good about Patchwork if you've never played it, is that the game designer isn't saying this is a blank canvas, do what you want with it. The game designer is saying this is this is you know poison, like the empty space is awful. Your entire goal is to fill it, and actually this gives you a, a different way of evaluating the, the, va the, the value of something, right? I'm not, when I'm looking at these cute little quilt squares, it's not just this one is worth so many points, it's this one is removing this much negative space from my quilt. Yes, I know it's got two or three or ten cute little blue buttons on it, but I also know that I'm not going to be losing all of these points, and it, it really takes the the mental exercise of how much is this action or that action or that action worth, and it kind of inverts it, or, or I guess it puts it on, on more like a two-sided scale than just the sky is the limit. Yeah, but we'll probably talk about this later, but I think most importantly, it's really clear feedback. The game is completely explicit in why you're being punished and how, and you know exactly how to avoid it. Fill your quilt. Easy, easy peasy. I've never filled my quilt. But it, not, not well. you know what to do. You know what you need to do. You don't understand how exactly yeah. you're yeah. going to go about it. So yeah, every single move in that game is rewarding you a little tiny bit. That's right. Yep. And then Agricola, I mean, just... Agricola is a weird one because it gives you negative points for every category you didn't get into. It's a complex Euro game about being very sad medieval farmers. <laughs> and it's not familiar. <laughs> and every single... There, there are too many categories of the game to do all of them well. And for everyone you don't do... You lose points like it's if you don't have any sheep like oh minus two points like what it's why but, it, but that is interesting because it also keeps I think it at least abates the the common problem of this with the game where someone monopolizes one tree and that was because well you already started on sheep I might as well not even start except for the fact that the rule book the the designer is going to punish me for not doing that so I at least need to give you some competition. Yeah. Even if it's token. Or you can just throw all the sheep in the oven. That's what I always do. So I'll, sheep, I'll just gobble those right up. And then point salad, I think, is a really interesting one because mm. it uh, it's a game where you've got these vegetable cards you're collecting, and they all start with no clear value. You take cards that tell you, hey, now for you, tomatoes and lettuce are worth two points. But it also tells you, oh, by the way, cabbage is minus one. So you inflict those negative points upon yourself. No one gets a negative score on point salad, but you're devaluing these things. It's like a some kind of some kind of self punishment mechanism or something. Sure. It's yeah, that I guess that one is almost rowing in the opposite direction. It's making you specialize. Yes. It's making it so that you have to start trying to monopolize one thing at the direct expense of another. Right. Yep. Yeah. And once again you can usually pretty easily tell this is exactly how much this sort of eventually has worked for me now. Sure, sure. Yeah. So hmm. And then Ticket to Ride, uh, not fulfilling your, your uh, graphics. Your right? Where you yep. up points. Auto lose and player elimination. This uh, one is divisive, I think it's safe to say. Um, so code names, I think, is a fun one because when you tell people that rule, by the way, there's one card where if you touch it, your team loses. People are often like, wait, what? Like, what do you mean? Like, yeah, it, that's it. You touch the assassin card, and your team has lost. And it... <laughs> Turns the game from like a minefield to a minefield with like a volcano in the middle you can fall into. Um, and just adds tension for the clue givers, adds tension for the people trying to trying to guess. Um, we've got uh, Luke and Louie, one of my favorite games, where you get knocked out of competition, but then you get to keep on playing, which is so weird. So you have lost this round. This is a children's game, by the way, with a little flying plane that it says four plus there in the corner. <laughs> four plus, I, I mean that plus just goes to infinity. It's a universal game, but when you get eliminated, you get to keep playing. You you got no stake in it anymore. So just whoever wronged you, whoever sent Louis at your chickens, just ruined their day, and you usually can succeed at that. So, um, mm. yeah, any of these you wanna talk about? Uh, I think. In, in Love Letter, yeah, I, so I, there's a four-player and there's even an eight-player version, and they went even further with the, the sort of expansion in this negative points and auto-lose direction. That 
queer is familiar with love letter? I feel like it's pretty common, but I want to make sure. Okay, so in love letter, as the vast majority of you know, there's a guard card, and that is that's not the same kind of punishment we're talking about, right? Because that is the the player the player action, but that person that you're targeting could have been dealt as one of the zero cards in the in the expanded version. If you target them with a guard, you're just out. So that is now your action, the person that you chose. You didn't know any better, but the person that you chose to try and knock out of the game, you knocked yourself out instead. Uh, which I just think is, is fascinating, kind of the way that it leans in even, even harder. Mm -hmm. I do, okay, but here you worked in your, your games as well. I guess, I guess I had to. So we talked about, <laughs> we talked about Tiny Towns. Um, Fit to Print isn't out yet, so people probably aren't familiar with it, but it's a game of building newspapers in real time. So what is the auto-lose in that one? The auto-lose, so you're building these newspapers, you've got a fixed time, four minutes per paper to build it, and at the end of three rounds, you add up your points, but you also add up your ad revenue. Ad revenue, it doesn't give you any points. If you have the most ad revenue, it doesn't matter. If you have the least ad revenue, you can't win. That's it. Uh, so, so it's pretty rough, but the game takes 15, 20 minutes to play, mm -hmm. and that is a rule that I had to, I had to fight for. We talked about, Flat Out and I, uh, who helped me develop it, talked about making it minus 10 points or minus 20 points, and it's like, well, at that point, you're already, like, you're basically lost. Like, this game's 20 minutes long. Can we just, just make them lose? I mean, and <laughs> most games have an auto-lose where if you don't have enough points, you, like, can't win. Of course, the only time it really matters is when you would have won. You have the most points, right. but unfortunately you have the least ad revenue, which happens often because the fewer ads you have, the more space you have for those juicy points that I'm telling you to go after. Um, maybe it's a little cruel, but uh, I think I hope it's successful. We'll find out. In a, we we in will. A little bit. High Society does the same thing. Well, so we've got yes. High Society in the corner here. Yeah, and I uh, the other example that I would put into this is uh, QE by Board Game Tables, now All Play, I think that they, they rebranded as. In in that case, it's, it's kind of the other, like, you spent the most, you lose. <laughs> right, so again, it's this tension of yeah, you're, you're doing this thing that we've told you is directly in your best interest. But if you do it too much, we're going to punish you for, you know, spending well, too much money or not taking it back. And one small detail about QE, you have whiteboards where you write down the amount who, because you're playing as banks that can print money. All right, again, I'm going to ask for a show of hands. Who here is familiar with QE? And I think it's going to be very, oh, no, it's more than I would have expected. Okay. It's so funny. It's one of those games where like you hear the rules and it shouldn't work, but it somehow does. So good. I've seen a lot of scientific notation in that game. I played it, it once. <laughs> I played it once against some statisticians and I won, and I decided I'm never playing it again because I'll never beat that. That's true. You, again, you have a whiteboard. It's an auction game with a whiteboard. There's no currency. There's no tokens. There's no chips. There's no cash. You just have a whiteboard. You can write whatever number you want. That's how much you spent. But you do tally that up. And whoever has spent the most at the end loses, straight up. So you want, sort of, to be the one that spends the second to the most because you're you're using that money well to win the right auctions for your country, right? Mm -hmm. But again, high you know high society has got this fit to print. It's kind of that upside down. Uh, yeah, I think that's interesting, particularly as it comes at the end of the. Games. You spent this entire time playing and not looking at ads enough, and then sure enough. Well, I put other punishing mechanisms through at the beginning and the middle as well. Sure. If you don't put sure, tiles sure. on your paper, you lose one point per tile. You do get to place them in the following round, so it gives you like a little bit of a head start, but you still don't want to do that. And then the articles all have a mood to them, happy or sad, and however off your mood is, too happy or too sad, you lose that many points there as well. We've got. Fifty we've got has quite a few negative. It's got negative points. It's almost like running a newspaper. Almost like that. My wife is an editor of a newspaper, so uh, uh, very much the inspiration. Sure. Uh, yeah. yeah. Good movies. Good movies. Yeah. Uh, do you want to talk about this one? Sure. Yeah. So uh, initially, this was just gambling, and I added to it bluffing, because I think that often the gambling side of things, and you can honestly, I feel like you could check on the end of this. Uh, tabletop, output randomness tabletop role-playing game, right? Oh, I'm going to gamble 
on this action where I know I'm going to need to roll and I might roll a one. And every time I choose to take an action where I might roll a one, I'm gambling on something really bad happening to me. And depending on the system, you know, it's D and D. I drop my sword or Warhammer Fantasy. I died somehow. Who knows? Uh, but I, I think in in the middle there, gambling also often deals with bluffing, and I think that's where this gets really interesting. Uh, one of the games that keeps in my bag is a game called Spicy. Uh, it's a bluffing game, but it's not so simple as to say, you're lying, and if I'm right, bad things happen to you, and if I'm wrong, bad things happen to me. I have to say exactly how you're lying. There's a number in a suit, and I have to guess either that it's the wrong number, or I have to say it's the wrong number or the wrong suit, and if I get it right, it's the same thing for CD normal. And I think, I think there again, Mechanically speaking, the punishment is entirely based on either the action of, well, I decided to bluff and maybe should have passed, and I got punished for it, or I decided to call this person out on it, and maybe I should have just let them get away with it. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that's another really fascinating way to, to introduce this sort of mechanically induced punishment, because I chose to do something that I could have chosen not to do or chosen to do something differently. And as a result of what I chose to do, the mechanics are saying, hey, here's a punishment. It's not so just it. being imparted upon you. Right, yeah. right, right. This, I'm, I'm not neutral here. I chose to call you out, or I chose to bluff. Right? Yeah. I think that's another, and so Perito there, or, or even Wits and Wagers can often get some of that into it, too, depending on which group you play with. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, I think we can move to this next group at Clifford so we can get to some yeah. discussion. Sure. Um, Damage in combat, again, when it's player inflicted, it's a little bit different from mechanical punishment. Um, cooperative games, it's uh, but, usually more mechanical punishment. And Blood Rage has uh, Ragnarok, uh, which is kind of a, a mix of both, right? Yes. Massive loss of life, but also points because you're Vikings. Yes, and then in Star Realms, damage is damage equals points. Again, it's a player game issue, but the whole game is just based around, uh, you know, slugging your opponent before they slug you and getting your base cards blown up. And then Luka Mui, again, is just all about damaging your opponent's chickens while protecting <laughs> yours. So um, so these are some that are just kind of tough to fit into one of these other categories. Cryptid is a game about trying to deduce where a cryptid, a legendary creature, lives. You're all researchers competing. And when you ask someone about certain information, um, if you're wrong about the place you're asking about, you have to give up some of your information, some of the stuff that you know. So the game punishes you by forcing you to cough up some of your information, give it to the rest and, of the table. And that's a guess, right? So I went to guess You went to guess, yes. Because you guess too soon. Because mm -hmm. a lot of where, where, in my experience, where a lot of deduction games that I've worked on break down is if players are just guessing all the time. Oh, I'm going to guess this, I'm going to guess that, I'm going to guess that. And so, I, again, we're directing the feedback, saying every time you do that and you're wrong, you have to give the other players around the table information, which is directly bad for you. So. For, to be clear, the only thing you can do in cryptid is guess. <laughs> you ask in, in a few one, different ways, yeah. Yeah, you ask someone, does this space fit your information? Yeah. Or you say, I think the cryptid's here, let's find out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then Galaxy Trucker, not only does it have negative points, but it also has a system where you're building a spaceship connected with pipes, basically, and as things hit your ship, you sometimes have to decide which chunk of your ship you want to keep, so it's a really difficult to measure punishing mechanism, but it's always, almost always your fault if you built your ship in one giant snaking pipe, then yeah, when you get hit in the center, you're choosing between halves of your ship, and it's, it's so funny, it's so awesome. very funny. Um, cockroach poker is a weird one, so it's got bluffing, which we talked about, you are passing someone a card with a bug on it and saying, this is a rat, and then they just decide whether you're lying or not, which um, is as dumb as it sounds, but it's also brilliant. And every time you're wrong, a card gets sent back to you, and it's like a negative set collection system, where if you're the first one to get four of one bug, you lose. So it's a, a really strange avoidance. Again, it tells you really clearly, maybe avoid rats because you've got three of them, and uh, you know, don't worry so much about the other bugs, except, okay, now you've got three rats and three frogs. You're not in a good situation here. No. Um, and then Jenga is just one of the most classic punishing mechanisms of you lose instantly. But it's also, like, Jenga is, Jenga is nothing without that part of the game. The whole sure. game is 
who is going to avoid this hot potato punishment um, of knocking the whole thing over? I think that's what we had for our main category. So, mm, why are negative points? I think we covered why we yeah. why we like them, why we think they can be functional. Um, I think they're not something that belongs in every single game. Sure. But I think punishing mechanisms maybe belong in most games. I think it's possible that the majority, maybe not by town, but I think the majority of games has something that can be construed as the mechanisms of this game are punishing you because you made this choice, this sure. action. So, um, and if anyone has anything at this point to add, I should uh, mention, by the way, you all have zero points right now. <laughs> anyone who's asked a question, you've got five points, and anyone else who asks any number of questions, you get five points. But if you don't ask any questions, minus ten points. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't see Azul on on the. I saw Azul at the beginning, but not at the end. And yeah. Can we differentiate between the negative point that comes from grabbing the first tile, which gives you an advantage next round, and like when you screw up and over grab too many tiles and overthrow a row? Yeah. So I think that first player token. Is it's still a punishment of sort, but it's a negative point that you very much choose. I'm gonna I'm gonna take this on. This is worth it. Usually, when you end up taking a bunch of tiles you can't use and get negative points for them, uh, it's not something you planned into your uh, into your strategy. So I think that's the main difference there. It's it's hot potato like you're all trying to position yourself, right? So you're not the one who takes like a useless seven reds, and then hilariously that game goes. Oh, you get minus one for like the first three or something, and then all the ones beyond that you get minus two. Like, oh, you're you're struggling here. Well, we're gonna give you more negative points. The worse you do. How's that sound? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's the difference between your conscious choice and usually the very unfortunate pile of tiles you're left with. Yep. Uh, yeah. So I saw Galaxy Trucker on there on the last slide. I found that that game is often uh, very difficult to play with a group of mixed skill levels because it is punishing both in terms of the speed that you play and like sort of the quality of the decisions that you're making. And so I was wondering if you had thoughts on how to balance punishing mechanics around the new player experience to make sure that you're not sort of just like blitzed out of the game in the first handful of turns because you don't know what you're doing and you don't know what a good decision is. I feel like you I feel like you sort of already answered it in part because skilled players can end their ship more quickly, which lets them flip the same timer that means this round is going to end, you know, and this runs out. So players have control over that very punishing mechanism. By the way, this is how long you have left, and of course a more skilled player will usually finish. First. So I think when you put those sorts of things in the hands of players, uh, that's when it can become an issue like that. Uh, I feel like there's another game that does something uh, something similar, but I can't think of it. And I, and I think actually Galaxy Truck is an interesting example because another punishing piece of, oh, my ship just got cut in half, is the insurance. I don't know if you... And in advanced, uh, on advanced boards, they take insurance away. And so one of the things... One of the things that's interesting perhaps about negative points is it also does give the players more knobs to change on their own. Uh, a game that does this particularly well, but I can't think of negative points for, is Oceans. And it, and it just clearly lays out, here's how to tweak the game for your preferences. And I think in Galaxy Trucker, that would be interesting if they said, hey, if you have mixed skill levels, take the insurance off of all of the advanced players. What's because the insurance again? So insurance says, so on each board, each tier of ship, you have a little pile, a little space on the board where it says all the broken off bits go here. And it says a maximum, the insurance is the maximum amount that you will have to pay at the end to cover the loss of all of those sewer pipes. And so uh, some of the boards just don't have that space on it. And, and that is saying you can lose infinite money. You can lose as much as you decide to put on your ship and it later gets busted off. And so for advanced players, for beginner players, you could increase the insurance to, to make it to, oh, you don't, you don't actually lose money on top of losing your ship. But for advanced players, take the insurance completely off. Say, great, every piece you lose, you got to pay for. 
Uh, but I think again, like that's that's giving them a very explicit. I don't think it's in the rules that way, but that would give the player a very explicit way to tweak it by the negative touch. So another class of games. I don't know if you um, <clears throat> would add this as another category or not. Um, are the heavier games like I'm thinking Glass and Railways of the World, where you're choosing negative points to gain mm. uh, as a loan? Um, right, you're paying points for money. We, cur points for currency. I think even uh, Tinner's Trail kind of allows you to trade resources for points early. Uh, it's not quite negative points, but it's trading resources for points early. Um, I so appreciate you calling that out. We didn't have specific examples, but that's one we had realized just before starting the panel. You're exactly right. And a simpler example, uh, if you're familiar with Machi Koro, right? So not even just the heavier games, though those are fantastic examples. In Machi Koro, you build, you choose to buy buildings for your town, and then you roll a die and see which buildings activate. Extremely simple mechanics. Well, in it is a loan office. And it says, when you build this thing, which is free, by the way, you get five bucks. Yay, go me. Money is I win the game. Except every time it's activated, you lose $2. So again, and, and with these loans, I would say they fit because they, they fit the definition of, I chose to take a loan. I chose to build this loan office. And now the mechanics are punishing me for making that choice, which in the case of something like Brass, might have been necessary. I might have just needed to get that loan to even continue playing, but uh, it's still a choice, and I still feel like I can play with it. I've got a question about uh, negative points, like um, as money, right? When we talk about like currency as points in particular, huh? um, it did I came in a little bit late, but was that a, 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 an area that was covered? Because it seems like spending money, right, is its own form of negative points, which money is the victory condition, is it not? I would, I would agree with that. Um, I also, having tried to make a few games where points are money and money is points, is hard. It is so hard to balance and get that all feeling right, and I almost always end up separating the two or getting rid of the money component. Yeah, I, I think I think you're, you're really, uh, you're tethering a lot, you're, you're making some tight coupling in that system because, and, and I think you're absolutely right. I don't know that I would think of it as punishment partially because it's there is no separation at all between I spent a certain number of points, but I probably got more points in the transaction I wouldn't have bought it in the first place, right? And so that's a little bit harder. I think it fits the definition technically, but it is harder to think of it as punishment because usually you're spending money to then get a thing that you immediately think of as more valuable than the money that you spent. But it is sort of an inherently punishing framework. Of the, more, the more money you have, yeah. the more you're going to win. You know, almost like in the real world, people who have more money are going <laughs> to be able to make more money from it. That's true. How about the front row? Yeah. Uh, my, my question has sort of expanded in my head as I've been sitting here because as we've been okay. talking, it's it's starting to feel like anything is a negative point. Like if you're trying to roll sixes and you roll a four, that's a negative two off your off your target. You know, like I, I'm not saying that's okay. what you're saying. Yeah. But I'm saying that when as we start to get into the idea of money as points, right? Um, I think of something, uh, something a tooltip from Magic Arena changed my entire like game design life. Okay. Which is life is a resource feel free to spend it. Sure. And I went, oh my god, this whole time, and all of, this, all of these years, I've always thought it's life being the thing you have to hold on to preciously. You and actually, like it's something you. that... <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, okay. okay. Green, green player. So, yeah, but like that turned everything entirely over. I, uh, I constantly remind my son, it doesn't matter how much help I have as long as you get to yeah. zero first. Yeah. Um, so, so I, I feel like this inherent, when I'm thinking about negative points, I feel yeah. this resistance to going too far beyond the pale of what you sort of presented initially in okay. terms of, um, you know, like, here's a card you have to hold on to. It might give you X benefit, but also at the end of the day, you're down. You're down a little bit. And that's, that's the interesting choice that a player has to make when they say, I am putting myself into debt in order to do this. Thing. And that's really interesting. So, with that in mind, and I'm looping this back into my original question, mm -hmm. 
Uh, with bluffing games like Perudo or anything else, is the negative point system your lie? Like you, you have uh, you've got four fours in your cup. Yeah. And you know you're tapped out. Sure. But you can give yourself a disadvantage, the disadvantage being dishonestly, you know, being like the fact that you are now in debt to your own words mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. saying, uh, I've got five fives. You know, and that's how you progress is by actually adding on negative points. Is that too, am I, am I taking, have I taken this too far? <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like in Perudo and Liar's Dice, which I believe are more or less yeah. interchangeable in their rules, I, yeah, I mean, to think of lies I, as punishment. I would say that it's too far because, again, if you go back to what I think is an excellent definition of a punishment, in, in this case, or punishing mechanics, it's the syst the mechanics themselves are the thing giving you negative points. Right? Negative points was a was a, a cute name for the panel, but really, it's it's the mechanics punishing you. The mechanics providing negative feedback, right? That's, I guess, even even more and more and more and more academic. We as game designers are constantly introducing new positive feedback mechanisms. Here's some points. Here's something for your tableau. Hey, I gave you some new cards. I gave you a new toy to play with. And so part of this was the the element of what I think is becoming less fashionable, which is the negative feedback. But how do we still use negative feedback positively? Right, and so in the Perudo case, I don't think it's the bluff that's the negative. It's getting called out on the bluff. Right, it's, it's bluffing and having that gambit not pay off. Uh, another, another game that I, I think about where it's not quite directly mechanically punishing, not quite the negative feedback. Uh, I play a lot of Redlands lately. And there are a lot of gambits and rallies. Oh, I'm going to invest all on this strategy. And I know if, I, if my wife punishes me for this and I die, it's because I invested too far. And that I think is a form of negative feedback that the game is providing me that that was too risky. That was too ridiculous a plan. Uh, though it's no less fun to try. In the second row, you had a question. Yeah. So. Um... You talked about um, player elimination as a negative point, and most I think all the examples you show are examples where player elimination happens at either the act of eliminating is the end of the game, or when the game ends, someone could be eliminated certain circumstances. But I think there are some historically popular board games that we might consider bad that player elimination is a term for them. That people are eliminated mid-game into the game, and then they're not playing anymore. Are there any games that you think are successful designs that have pre-end of game play elimination as a negative point? So one of the ones that was on that slide was Love Letter, uh, and that one is I I would call successful, and I would say is a just a really good, mm -hmm. really fun game, but is eliminating. It, you're constantly whittling down the, the players. Isn't Love Letter you first? Is a whole not not sorry, round by round yes, but. Love letter, you, you you play rounds and you still even if you lose a round, go ahead and you still you still stay in the game, right? And I actually like we we're talking about with lose a turn, so Pete you said, hey, maybe having people play less of your game isn't a good way to go about it. I actually think <laughs> that quick turnaround times on what a game can be is the way to introduce mid game player elimination without them playing your game less or them losing interest. And it okay, it's a round, right? We called it a round in Love Letter, but it's really the game. The, the game is get to a heart. And we repeat that game over and over and over and over again. It, I, uh, I think of the Hoyle style, these old card games. A lot of those are repeat this game until someone gets to so many points, right? And, and Love Letter to me fits right in there with, oh, okay, yeah, you got knocked out of the game. But you'll be back in again for the next round. So you just go around. Did you have anything to add to it? I guess I would say Tiny Towns has a form of that. You're because done with your round because your board is filled up with stuff yeah. you can't use. You're That's not necessarily true. out of the competition, but your your experience can end long before yeah. someone else's. Yeah. Uh, I think the question is 
Yeah, so we had a second one in the third row. Oh, I was just going to bring up the fact that like, some games do require no league content, like in poker games, like three pot poker or whatever, no league. If you ever played it with like kids, and they're like, oh, yeah, spend money, whatever. The game play is totally different. It doesn't play like you would think poker plays on the line. Um, just because there's no penalties for losing, there's only winning, so there's no reason not to win a multi possession with like grab four in the bag, grab another 100 chip points, and get another deck. Um, so some games like really require it to get the right experience and the right feel. And especially for combat games, you expect to lose stuff when you engage in combat. If you don't lose anything, it doesn't quite feel right to the player, so you might think it feels too too giving or too forgiving. Alright, so, uh, so whenever I hear um, like positive and negative, I, um, I have this problem kind of finding that to rotate it out like opposites. And so there's a lot of like sort of positive things and negative things that have natural opposites on the other side of like player elimination. There's also auto wins and there's just like, um, you know, cost. There's also things that get you just more money and then things like that. And so output random can give you positive or negative results. Um, so I guess sort of in a weird, Theoretical sense. I guess I'm wondering uh, if there's any examples you can think of of something on sort of one end of the spectrum that doesn't really have a natural opposite. Like, is there anything that you can do with negativity that literally just doesn't have an equivalent on the pot or an equivalent opposite on the opposite side, or vice versa? I guess. Yeah. Yeah. That's tricky. Yes. <laughs> so I would look at it slightly differently. Uh, I think some have a direct. Uh, a direct opposite. But what I would what I would sort of caution is even if some of these are easy to put on a on a clear binary spectrum like like auto win or, or lose, um, like it, as some of the questions you're getting to, I think some of them aren't so clear. Am I spending money or am I losing money? And I think that what I would look at is positive feedback. Part of why I think designers use it so frequently is we get to a point in our game design where we know where the fun is. I know the fun of my game is this. And I also added these things for some reason. Hopefully it was a good one. But this is the fun. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you positive feedback for doing this one. Because this is the fun one, right? And actually, one of the reasons I might have introduced some of these things is not to pull you towards the fun, but to push you away from the not fun. We talked about uh, specialization and, and trying to avoid letting players specialize by penalizing you for being too specialized. Or vice versa, I'm going to penalize you for not specializing. Now I'm going to penalize you for having too many things, right? Those are systems that can't pull you to the fun, but they can push you away from the not fun. And I think that a lot of those, you you can't necessarily find a direct binary. This is the opposite of that. And I think that that's part of what makes negative points so hard, or the sort of mechanical negative feedback so hard to do, because it's much easier to pull you to the fun than it is to decide exactly where to place the pushing so that it'll keep you away from the not fun. right? Because, I don't know, how many of you have ever introduced a mechanic to your game, thinking it would direct players to do X, and they did Y instead, which turned into a new problem, right? And so you can wind up in this dance where, okay, we really want people to do this. Nope, they're doing that. All right, we'll make this punishing. Nope, now they're doing that. We'll make that punishing too. Now they're doing this other one, right? And you can keep playing whack-a-mole with the not fun and trying to get players to go away from it. If you're just using negative feedback for those. So, it, it, But it's the mixture that can often be, okay, we can fix the hot spots of not fun with a little bit of negative fun. And we can direct them to the fun with some positive rewards. And then often it's that balance that winds up consistently directing quite a few different kinds of people towards the thing that you have made that is really wonderful to develop. I like that. <laughs> <That's> awesome, <yeah. laughs> Does that answer your question? Sorry, I, think, I, think I thought that was a great question. Thank you. <laughs> um, you were talking, I, I forget which one of you brought it up, you were talking about player elimination, where the elimination doesn't happen at the end. One of the ones I've seen that's pretty common is, it's a, a cooperative game, and if you lose, you play as the bad thing. And like, oh, that, uh, like Nemesis has that, 
Um, you, know, you have people on a spaceship. You've got goals. If you die, you play as the aliens. Um, and that's really bad for the players who are still in the game because if it's something sentient now against them, it's going to be so much harder to win. So it's almost like a, you do kind of have to work with people because if you get them out, it's going to make them harder for you. So that is an so, example of where you can, you can te you're technically out of the game because your character is like dead, but you're not, you're not out out of the game. It's kind of like a domain shift, you know? Don't stop playing. So we, you don't stop playing. Yeah. We're right about at the end of time. Are there any other questions left that we can answer? Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. So anything you want to add to wrap up the idea? Negative points are great. They make, <laughs> they make your points even better That's because right. they're just worse thing now. I just think <laughs> it's, a, it's an extra tool you have to. That's right. Put That's right. Yeah. Are double negative extra points really really bad or are they positive? Mm. Double mm. negative. Double e double negative extra points. <laughs> extra point. The extra is throwing me. Extra. I feel like they've got to be they've got to be positive, right? That's what? how that's how math works. Yeah. Good question. That'll that's be right. next year's right. panel. Double, <laughs> double negative extra points. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Can you? Okay. Question.